Ever since the fall of man, God has communicated to us through his prophets. The first biblical reference to a prophet is found in Deuteronomy 18.18 18, that says, I will raise up for them a prophet. I will put my words in his mouth, and he will tell them everything I command him. Prophets, holy men and women of God, were used to communicate God's thoughts and his will to others. The foretelling of future events was not a necessary part of a prophet's calling. God used prophets primarily to correct moral and religious abuses and to proclaim great moral truths that are connected with the character of God and which lie, lie at the foundation of his government. So prophets might foretell the future, but more often they had a message to correct God's people's behavior. Now, the question arises, will God have prophets in the last days? In the last days, God said, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. Even on my servants, both men and women, I will pour out my spirit in those days, and they will prophesy. Acts 2, 17 and 18. So clearly, men, women, old and young, will have light before Jesus comes through the power of the Holy Spirit. Does this mean that we should believe everyone who claims they are a prophet? Absolutely not. We will look at ways to test those who claim to be a prophet. Daniel was a prophet, and I believe we can all agree after studying the book of Daniel so thoroughly that he stands in direct line with many other great prophets of Scripture. The visions and dreams that Daniel saw and recorded in his book of 12 chapters are part of a collection of the 66 books that make up the Bible. Let's talk now about how God communicates his message to the world through men and women. In Numbers 12.6, we know that God communicates in dreams and visions. A dream occurs when a prophet sleeps. We're all aware of that. When we sleep, we have dreams. And when a vision occurs, the person is awake. So these did not arise out of ordinary circumstances in life. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit. In other words, some churches lining up elders and laying hands on people and prophesying about future jobs or marriage or so forth in your life isn't the way that God works. We know Daniel had dreams and visions, and we read about those in Daniel 7, 1 and 8, 1. What physical phenomenon accompanied Daniel while he was in vision? Daniel 10, verses 8 through 10, verse 17 and 18. This will help you discern who is a genuine prophet and who is not. So this is a little instruction guide. A, there remain no strength in me. So the person will be under the control of the Holy Spirit, including his or her physical body. B, there w then was I in a deep sleep on my face. In other words, a genuine prophet will not know what is going on around them while they are in vision or in a dream from the Holy Spirit. See, the next thing it says is, and hand touched me, which set me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. So the prophet can have interaction with a heavenly being by being touched or by having a conversation while in a vision or a dream. D, neither is there breath left in me. Now this is an important one. Here's the very real thing about a genuine prophet of God. 
they will not breathe while they are in vision, no matter how long. Yet, they can talk, move about, they can lift heavy objects, and so forth as part of their vision or dream from God. E, he strengthened me. Again, this is an interesting phenomenon. While in vision, the person may do something that they could not do in their ordinary life. They may lift something or behave in a way that is out of the ordinary for their size or their situation. So physical phenomenon accompanies the prophets while in vision, demonstrating to everyone around them that they are receiving something that is coming from a supernatural source. We should expect God to work with prophets today the same as he worked with them in biblical times because we know in Malachi 6, it says God never changes. So who is the source of the messages that the prophets received in vision? 2 Peter 1, 21 says, holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Ghost, which we know is the Holy Spirit. No prophet of God thought up the things that they wrote. They wrote them in the language, and they wrote them for their times, but their thoughts were inspired by the Holy Spirit. Amos 3, 7 tells us that surely the Lord God will do nothing but he reveals his secret unto his servants, the prophets. Before God does anything significant on earth involving his people, he first reveals it to the prophets through dreams and visions. God chose men and women, such as Miriam in Exodus 15, 20, Huldah in 2 Chronicles 34, 22, and Anna, in Luke 2:36. In Acts 21:9, there are four unmarried daughters who prophesied. God chose to give the prophetic gift to those individuals who could best serve him at the time, whether men or women. When Jesus returned to heaven after his resurrection, what did he give to men? Well, we read in Ephesians 4, 7 and 8, it says, But to each one of us, grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, he says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. Why did Jesus give gifts to the church? Well, in Ephesians 4, 12, it tells us, For the equipping of the saints, for the work of ministry, for the edifying or building up of the body of Christ. We read that again in Ephesians 4, 12. What is one of the gifts of the Spirit? Well, 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11 says, But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit. To another, the word of knowledge through the same spirit. To another, faith by the same spirit. To another, gifts of healings by the same spirit. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning spirits. And to another, different kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same spirit works all these things, distributing to each one of us individually as he wills. 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 through 11. So, there are many gifts given by the Spirit to each of us individually. Today, our focus is the gift of prophecy. Which gift of the Spirit does Paul place above all? other spiritual gifts, including the gift of tongues. Let's read in 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 and 5. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. 
I wish you all spoke with tongues, but even more that you prophesied. For he who prophesies is greater than he who speaks with tongues, unless indeed he interprets that the church may receive edification. 1 Corinthians 14, verses 1 and 5. Why is prophecy given? 1 Corinthians 14, verses 3 and 4 tells us. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. Again, 1 Corinthians 14, verses 3 and 4. Prophecy is not just about predicting or foretelling the future. Prophets bring messages from God. They do, num number one, they edify, so they strengthen and build up the church. Two, they exhort, they e encourage, they motivate the believers. And three, to bring comfort, to bring peace and healing, all of which we as God's church need. Where is prophecy in the list of spiritual gifts? 1 Corinthians 12, 28. And God has appointed these in the church. First, apostles. Second, prophets. Third, teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, and varieties of tongues. Again, 1 Corinthians 12, 28. We repeat many Bible verses to you because we want you to look these up and study these for yourself so that you will see that God's word speaks truth to us. And that is why we spend this time sharing this with you. Only apostles and church leaders is listed above the prophets. This shows us the importance that God places on the gift of prophecy but also indicates that a prophet is to be subject to or under the direction of the church. Prophets, prophets should work in cooperation with the church and not independent of the church. This is important. We've seen prophets come out of the woodworks over the years that we've been alive on this earth. And if that prophet is not associated with the church, with the truth, then that is not a prophet. There's no truth in him. And people have followed many, unfortunately, that have walked this earth that have convinced or mesmerized them to follow him in his unbelief. According to the Bible, how can we determine true gifts of the Spirit from false gifts? The Bible has a lot to say about this topic, giving us fair warning. Again, let's begin in 2 Peter 2, verse 1. But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. That is 2 Peter 2, 1. We find in Acts 20, 30 that it says, Also from among yourselves men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away the disciples after themselves. Another sign. Then in Matthew 24, verses 4 and 5, we read, And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you. For many will come in my name, saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. Another warning is to always test what you're hearing against God's word. Here we read in 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. If the devil and Satan knows that God speaks to us through prophets, do you not believe for one second that the best way to deceive us would to impersonate a prophet and try to come here and deceive us so that we'll follow the prophet? But you have to take it back to the Bible and see what the Bible says about prophets, and it will help you to discern that. Once again, we see a warning in 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 21. Test all things, 
hold fast to what is good, meaning that we should always test what we're hearing with God's word and hold only to the truth. There will be false prophets and teachers, not only in the world, but among the people who profess to be Christians. The only way we can determine who is a true prophet or teacher is to test the things they say by what is written in the Bible. Anyone who teaches heresies or false teachings cannot be considered God's messengers. Be wary also of people who take one text out of the Bible and build a whole a theology around that for people to follow because we have always said that things in the Bible can be found in other places in the Bible. The Bible helps to solidify itself and that the truth is spread throughout the Bible. So be careful of that because people will take one verse and they'll build their whole doctrine on that verse and then you're like, but it's in the Bible, but did you read the context? And did you read inside the Bible elsewhere where God has referenced that and what is meant by that. What are the tests of a prophet or a person who shows signs or miracles? Again, God wants to make sure that we're not deceived. He gives us many references in his word. We will look at a few here in Jeremiah 28, 9, Deuteronomy 13, verses 1 through 5, Matthew 7, 21 through 23, and Isaiah 820. As for the prophet who prophesies of peace, when the word of the prophet comes to pass, the prophet will be known as one whom the Lord has truly sent. Jeremiah 28, 9. If there rises among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams, and he gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign of the wonder comes to pass, of which he spoke to you, saying, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them. You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. You shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice and you shall serve him and hold fast to him. But that prophet or that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken in order to turn you away from the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you from the house of bondage to entice you away from the Lord your God, commanded you to walk. So you shall put away the evil from your midst. Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 5. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall I enter the kingdom, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. And Isaiah 8, 20 says, To the law and to the testimony. If they do not speak according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. The Bible is clear that accurate predictions of the future is one of the tests of a true prophet. But it is not the only test. Even when signs, miracles, and accurate predictions are done in Jesus' name, if the person does not teach according to God's law and his word, that person is a false prophet. Must a, person, must a person's written works be included in the Bible to be qualified as a prophet? 1 Chronicles 29.29 29. Now the Acts of King David... First and last, indeed, they are written in the book of Samuel, the seer, in the book of Nathan, the prophet, and in the book of Gad, the seer, in 1 Chronicles 29, 29. Now, the rest of the acts of Solomon, first and last, are they not written in the books of Nathan, the prophet, in the prophecy of Ahijah, the Shilamite, and in the visions of Iddo, the seer, concerning Jeroboam, the son of Nebat? 
2 Chronicles 9, 29. The written works of Nathan, Gad, Ido are not found in the Bible, but they were no less prophets of God. Are only men used by God as prophets in Luke 2.36? Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, the daughter of Phanuel of the tribe of Asher. She was of a great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity, Luke 2.36. So we see there were prophetesses and women prophets. How long will the gifts of the Spirit continue to be given? Well, Ephesians 4.13 tells us, Till we all come to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the statue of the fullness of Christ. Ephesians 4.13 the gifts of the Spirit will continue as long as man needs to develop and grow spiritually to the point of perfection. Then we'll go on until the judgment closes and man's probationary time ceases. That's basically until Christ returns for us. So prophecy will continue for us. God still wants to communicate to us through prophets. He has not stopped that when the Bible spoke of the time of the end. He says he will continue until the time of the end. What will God do in the last days, the, the time to the end before Jesus comes back? We read that in Joel 2, 28, verses 28 through 31. And it shall come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. And also on my manservants and my maidservants, I will pour out my spirit in those days. And I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. We see that in Joel 2, 28 through 31. To whom does God give the Holy Spirit? Acts 5, 32 tells us, and we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who, who obey him. Acts 5.32 Those who obey him receive the Holy Spirit. What is one of the identifying marks of God's remnant last day people? Revelation 12.17 and 14.12 We discussed this in the previous lesson that we did on the remnant church. But let me summarize. And the dragon was enraged with the woman and he went to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's Revelation 12, 17. And Revelation 14, 12 tells us, here is the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Well, what is this testimony of Jesus in Revelation 19, 10? And I fell at his feet to worship him. But he said to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow servant and of your brethren who have the testimony of Jesus. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10. God's end-time remnant, remnant people will have the gift of prophecy among them. God gives this gift to show his people the future and to build them up or edify them and encourage them to face the trials that come in the last days. Is there a church today that meets the standards of being God's last day remnant church? One, that they keep the commandments of God and two, that they have the testimony of Jesus or prophecy that we spoke of in Revelation 14, 12, 12, 17, and 19, 10. 
the Seventh-day Adventist Church meets that criteria. The Seventh-day Adventist Church teaches and follows the commandments of God. They have the prophetic gift in the ministry of Ellen G. White. Miss White, who lived from 1827 to 1915, met the tests of a prophet that we discussed earlier. She taught and followed the commandments of God and was given the prophetic insights into the future. Her writings on health were way ahead of her time. Her devotional writings are among the best ever in building personal relationships with God. What is God's counsel regarding prophets? 1 John 4, 1, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. God asks us to test the spirits. He wants us to take advantage of all the gifts and the blessings that he sends us, but he does not want us to be fooled by false teachings that are sent by Satan. We must test the teachings of all prophets to see if they are from God. Are they in alignment with God's word? Test the writings of Ellen White to see if they are from God. What are some of the tests of a prophet? One, a true prophet is in harmony with God's word. So there'll be nothing they say or write that would not be in perfect alignment with what God's word says. A true prophet pre predictions come true. A true prophet's teachings edify the church. A true prophet exalts Christ, the Son of God, and a true prophet bears fruit. In December of 1844, a 17-year-old girl by the name of Ellen Harmon was in frail health and only had a third grade education. She received her first vision while kneeling in prayer with a group of women in Portland, Maine. She later married William White, and we know her today as Ellen White. She shrank from the prospect of being called a prophet, yet she dared not to be disobedient to God. So she related what God had shown her. For 69 years, she continued to receive visions and dreams from the Lord. She became one of the most prolific female authors in history, with over 50 books still published today in multiple languages. Was this a genuine or a counterfeit manifestation? Was it fulfillment of biblical promise that the prophetic gift would be restored to the church at the end of time? Physical phenomenon accompanied Ellen White's visions. You remember we talked about that earlier in the book of Daniel as it was defined of a prophet. Now, if she was a true prophet, they will match what we've learned, again, in the Bible from the people that are in vision and the phenomenon that occurred. One, did not breathe, although some visions lasted for four hours. Not breathing for four hours tells me there's something supernatural going on there, right? Physicians who examined her in vision marveled that she did not breathe, yet she could talk and move about all without breathing. Loss of physical strength, sometimes replaced by supernatural strength. She once held a 17 pound Bible in her outstretched arm, her hand, for over 30 minutes, turning the pages to text that she was being shown in vision. At that time, she only weighed 97 pounds and was in frail health. Again, another accompaniment of something supernatural. But this still doesn't tell us if she was genuine. We still need to test her works according to the scriptures. The first biblical test of a prophet can be found in Isaiah 8:20. To the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to the word, there is no light in them.
the law and the testimony was an Old Testament expression for the Bible. The law referred to the first five books of Moses, and the testimony referred to the books of the prophets of the Old Testament. The basic meaning of the text is a genuine prophet will not contradict the Bible. What God reveals today will not disagree with what he has previously revealed in the Bible. If a prophet disagrees with scripture, that person is a false prophet. There is no place in Ellen G. White's writings where she disagrees with anything being said in scripture. The second test of a prophet can be found in 1 John 4, 2. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh of God. True prophets will lift up Jesus Christ. They will elevate and exalt him. Pick up any of her books and you will quickly see that she beautifully fulfills this test of a prophet. The third Bible test of a prophet can be found in Matthew 7, 20. By their fruits you shall know them. The Bible prophets were not perfect, nor is any prophet perfect. They weren't sinless. They were human, but the general tendency of their life was in harmony with the word of God. The fourth Bible test of a prophet can be found in Jeremiah 28, 9. When the word of the prophet shall come to pass, then shall the prophet be known that the Lord hath truly sent him. So when you see the things the prophet says come true to life and happen, you will know. Here are some examples from her writings over the years. Some evidences of her prophetic gift. In 1864, when many doctors believed that tobacco was beneficial in treating lung disease, she wrote this. Now, this is in 1864. Tobacco is a poison of the most deceitful and malignant kind. It is all the more dangerous because it affects upon the systems are, that are so slow and scarcely perceivable. Kind of like a cancer, right? In 1957, almost 100 years later, the American Cancer Society concluded what is now well known in the medical field, that smoking is a causative factor in lung cancer. In 1905, she wrote, people are continually eating flesh that is filled with tuberculosis and cancerous germs. Tuberculosis, cancer, and other fatal diseases are thus communicated. That is found in her book on Ministry of Healing, page 313. We now know that viruses, or germs, as they were referred to by Miss White, are a factor in cancer. In 1902, she warned that San Francisco and Oakland will be visited by the Lord because they were becoming like Sodom and Gomorrah. On April 18, 1906, the great San Francisco earthquake occurred. On one occasion, when in New York City, I was in the night season, called upon to behold buildings rising story after story toward heaven. These buildings were warranted to be fireproof, and they were erected to glorify the owner's and builders. The scene that next passed before me was an alarm of fire. Men looked at the lofty and supposed fireproof building and said, they are perfectly safe, but these buildings were consumed as if made out of pitch. The fire engines could do nothing to stay the destruction that's in the Testimonies of the Church, Volume 9, pages 11 and 12. On September 11, 2001, the Twin Towers were reduced to rubble 
in just a few hours. So many of the things that she had communicated so many years in advance of their occurring and us finding out or coming to the conclusion of and now getting to see in retrospect came true just as she saw in a vision and had communicated in her writings. Still in alignment with God's word, just giving us additional information about what is to come. So here's a summary of the Bible tests of a prophet. They speak according to the Bible. They confess Jesus Christ. They bear the fruit of the Spirit, and prophetic words come true. Please understand that prophets of God never give predictions about mundane things, such as winning elections, astrology, and so forth. God's prophecies always deal with the work of salvation for the souls of men and women. God tells them what is going to come and what is going to pass for the purpose of the people living in that day and their sins that are coming on and drawing close to God. So to turn people away from their sins and draw them closer to God, God uses prophets to communicate to us, to warn us or show us if we've fallen away what God sees as the future. Protestant governments will reach a strange pass. They will be converted to the world. They will also, in their separation from God, work to make falsehood and apostasy from God the law of the nation. That was in the Review and Herald, June 15, 1897. Tell me, do you think you could have predicted over a hundred years ago that the government would be converted to the world and work to make falsehood and apostasy from God the law of our nation? No one in their right mind would have come up with that, would have thought that, or would have even agreed that that would happen. Has prophecy been fulfilled in our Supreme Court's federal law to legalize same-sex marriage? Is our nation the nation spoken of here, and that we are turning the laws of this nation into the apostasy against God's word. And we've seen it over and over again, and sadly, we're seeing it come upon the world more and more quickly. As America, the land of religious liberty, shall unite with the papacy, enforcing the conscience and compelling men to honor the false Sabbath, the people of every country on the globe will be led to follow her example. This is found in her writings on the Testimonies of the Church, Volume 6, page 18. Once again, telling us the world that we're living in today and seeing this come to life, that all the religions are trying to unite through the help of the papacy who is leading the charge to get us to agree to this green Sabbath, which happens to be on Sunday and not the Sabbath God spoke of in the fourth commandment that we should obey. It's coming on the world. She shared this in her testimonies of the church, once again, well in advance of knowing anything that would be happening in our day and time. The substitution of the laws of men for the law of God. The exaltation by merely human authority of Sunday in place of the Bible Sabbath is the last act in the drama. When this substitution becomes universal, God will reveal himself. Again, this is found in Testimonies of the Church, Volume 7, page 141. 
the time of trouble will begin. That really shouldn't frighten any of us, but in the midst of the time of trouble that is coming, God's chosen people will stand unmoved. Satan and his host cannot destroy them, for angels that excel in strength will protect them. Testimonies of the Church, Volume 9, page 17. Everyone should listen to this. None of us want to be outside of God's will when the time of trouble begins. Only those who have completely surrendered to him will be prepared for what's coming next. I have this conversation on a regular basis, and I've had the pleasure of having a friend stay in my home for the last 10 days who has been born and bred and raised in a Catholic church. And we had several deep discussions, and he asked me, why have I never heard this? Why don't I know this? And why is the church not teaching this? And I said, go to the Bible. Use that as your source. Don't believe me. Don't believe my pastor. Don't believe your priest. Don't believe. Go to God and let him reveal to you the truth of what is happening and what is coming on this world. We are seeing friends, family, and loved ones being led astray through a very slow deception that has occurred over time, and people have just adopted it. People have said, I've mentioned this before, that they are too busy to read God's Word, so they will depend on the people they listen to on the radio or in devotionals or uh, in front of the pulpit, whichever church they go to or whatever they're listening to, they depend on them for being the truth tellers. And the only real truth is in the Bible. We speak from the Bible. We quote Bible verses because it's very important for you to know that what we say comes out of God's Word. We are not interpreting this ourselves. We reference many Bible verses, so you will know that the Bible is interpreting itself not us. And we're just sharing that with you. So we hope if you're listening to this and you understand that God purposefully brought you here today to hear this message that we are in the end of time. God has sent us a prophet to enlighten us further about what is to come and that we need to be prepared like never before. We might be put in jail. We might be hiding in caves. But we will be protected. God has told us that in his word. And he cannot lie. So we have to believe in the promises God gives us. We should not shudder in fear. We should not run to and fro and act crazy because we're scared of what's coming down on the world because we know what prophecy says. We have to walk in the confidence of God and the Holy Spirit saying, God loves me. He's with me. He will never forsake me no matter what comes on the world. I believe in his word and I'll follow what he has told me to do. And that is for us to share the truth of God's word. That's why I stand here and Ellie stands here and our pastors stand here to share the truth of God's word. And you don't have to be a pastor or a teacher. You just have to be a friend and a loved one to do the very same thing. You don't have to memorize scripture to share God's love with people in your life. God will be sending people to you. He'll send people to your home. He'll send people to your work. He'll send people to your door. And these people are being sent because God knew they were a little bit hungry. The question is, is did you open the door and give them some food, some spiritual food? Did you give them some of God's word? Did you tell them that God loves them no matter what's going on in this chaotic world? Because so many people are trapped watching the news, and I would call it the fear factor that they put on the news to have everybody scurrying, running to and fro, and being scared about what's going to happen. Oh, no, who's going to be in charge? Oh, do you see the evil that's going on? And, and it can cause us to be frightful. And God says, I will bring you peace and joy in the midst of the storm. And so if we look calm, 
and happy and confident, people may come up to us and say, why are you like that in the midst of all that's going on? And we can share with them that we have a God that we know where we're going and we have a God that loves us and loves them and wants them to be in the same place we are and to have the same peace and calmness in the midst of the storm. Ellen White points to, supports, and uplifts the Bible. I imagine that it must frustrate Jesus that he sends one of his servants to teach us, his people, and they are rejected. If a prophet is sharing knowledge that supports and uplifts the Bible text, if it enhances our understanding and brings us closer to Christ, then why would we not study it and thank God for the instruction that he has given us through his prophets? No other woman in history has written more works than Ellen White. Having never heard of Ellen White myself just eight years ago for me before I came into this church, I was a bit skeptical, and I would imagine some listening might be as well. I felt that as I read her books, I needed to see if they were in alignment with God's word for educating us in the ways of living a more godly life centered on the love of Christ to see if her writings lined up with biblical truth. And I have certainly not read anything in her writings that warrant me to think anything except that God used her as a prophet to bring clarity to his word and be completely aligned to his message. You need to see for yourself. I always want more detail and I wished I had more insights to the events that the Bible speaks about. And Ellen White provided that for me. The thing that truly amazed me is I read the Bible, and unless you really understand the context of when each book of the Bible was written, the history, the time the book was written, and why they used those words in the Bible, why couldn't they have written it so we understand it better? Because it was written during a different time. And I really didn't understand some of the detail in the Bible. And I said, I wish I knew a little bit more. And then I would search Ellen White's writings. And there in vision, God provided her through the Holy Spirit to share with us that little bit more of detail that I needed. And I was amazed. I said, wow, this is like the cheat sheet for the Bible. It kind of gives us a lot more detail than we might get just reading the Bible. The Bible is all true. There is nothing in it that is not true. But if we can read supplements to the Bible that take us a level deeper and give us a little bit more so that our understanding is broadened, we thank God for her and her writings, that he sent a prophet to us that in our day and time would explain more for us what has been going on in this spiritual battle between heaven and earth between God and Satan. What is going on in the day and time that we're living in? That's the amazing thing, is here we are living in 2022, and we're saying, wow, we are seeing a lot of what God has said, and Ellen White has foretold through her visions and dreams, coming true in the day and time that we're living. And she says, and God says, we are living in the time of the end. So why wouldn't we believe it and why wouldn't we read it? It is such a great start to using it while you study your Bible to get a more depth in some areas of the Bible and the way that we live holy lives. You can start with Steps to Christ. One of her very popular books, well written and studied and read by millions, or The Great Controversy that goes and explains the Bible in a different light, but enhances what the Bible says and does not go away from the main message of the Bible. The great controversy brings light to the spiritual battle that is going on, that we live every day and don't even realize is going on. We don't know that Satan's evil angels are trying to attack us and God's angels have surrounded us and protected us 
from those attacks. There are some people I recently talked to that said, I wish I could see God really working in my life. And then we have a conversation about their past. And it comes to light that God has been there all along. When things happen that could not be explained, that was God protecting them and taking care of them so they could get to this day and time so that they would be here to really learn God's truth and have this incredible relationship with God. And God has done that for each one of us. If you look in your history, in your past, you'll see God has been there the entire time, saving you from yourself and allowing you to go through challenges so that he could grow you and mold you and make you into his image. So I'd ask you today to consider that God has sent us a prophet to this day and time that would help us to learn how to live in these last days on earth as the time of the end nears and as we see much of what was written come true.